Okay, the second half of this morning's agenda is going to start with Enzo Blanc, who's going to talk to us about the Fit for 55 initiative. I won't steal his thunder any more than that. I'll let him explain. Welcome, Enzo. Thank you, Richard. So, this room looks familiar to me. Um, so, how did we come to all of a sudden organize a workshop, specific full day workshop all around uh, open BIM and digital passports uh, called Fit for 55? Well, we had a round table discussion in, um, in Rome uh, with a few people from uh, a few manufacturers, a few people from the product uh, domain, uh, a few people from GS1, and we recognized that we didn't have uh, all of the representatives of the uh, AEC industry in the room or in this community. So we said we needed some other people. So we needed a broader variety of stakeholders. We needed manufacturers, we needed construction companies, um, ideally also a few others. Um, and we needed to come up with a clear value proposition and some real use cases um, where products are more central, the manufacturer are central, and how do we connect all of this, the product, the physical product to the generic um, abstract designs, let's say. So what were the topics? The topics were mainly around um, products, of course, as I mentioned, data templates, dictionaries, open BIM, around climate change, very important, and the data workflows across the whole life cycle, asset life cycle management. Um, this is uh, the room, quite packed. I think we had 110 people <clears throat> in the room at the start, and even towards the end when we had two breakout rooms, we had still, I think, 25 people per breakout room, so 50 in total. I think um, there was quite some uh, interest, and uh, I think it was a good opportunity to learn and create some awareness. We did a poll during the workshop, and it showed that we had a very good mix of attendees, the equal share of designers, architects, and of manufacturers. I think we had uh, more manufacturers than we have ever had in, uh, in a Building Smart Summit. Um, we had a smaller share of construction companies and software providers other than CAD software providers. And unfortunately, we didn't have any representative of what we call the second life stakeholders. So people that decide what is happening with the products uh, or the material once you start deconstructing it. Um, this is uh, the agenda, very imp impressive agenda, I think. And we started off ba basically in three parts, uh, sort of introduction. Um, regulation was, of course, very important here. We've heard uh, Oscar Nieto talk on Monday. He came back on Tuesday with a bit more focus on manufacturers and a bit of a longer uh, uh, discussion, also with some Q&A. Then uh, a bit of an introduction to the standards. Um, what standards are we talking about? Which standards are involved? We have had some uh, quite a few um, contributions real uh, life cases, use cases, 10 use cases presented by uh, quite a lot of people, and you will see them a bit later on. Um, first part was mainly on the regulation. So what are we talking about? We are talking about the EU Green Deal, which has a lot of ramifications on what is happening. And I just want to make sure that um, this is not only around the uh, important for Europe, this is important for it worldwide because Anybody that wants to do business in the European Union will need to take, to some extent, take that into account, those regulations. Um, just want to make sure that we do not mix up things. There is, first of all, the Eco-Design Sustainable Products Regulation, which um, re requires a digital product passport for every product that comes into the European Union. Um, but this is cross-sector. This is really cross-sector. It goes from apparel, batteries, uh, tires, um, uh, consumer electronics, and then we have at the same time a revision of the construction product regulation. The person that we talked to, uh, or that, that presented Oscar, he is from that, from that area, so he has been working in the Construction Product Europe Association, um, and he makes sure that those two connect, that they do not do, uh, decide on different things. Um, so what, uh, why is the new CPR, so construction products regulation necessary? On the one hand, for the economy, it's about digitization, it's about um, creating, uh, improving the competitiveness of the sector within the European Union, but also with the competitors outside. And of course, the other uh, aspect is the environmental sustainability. Sustainability is leading all of this. When we talk about fit for 55, um, 
So that is the, the, the second um, subtitle of the workshop. We're talking about a set of, uh, so a package with a set of regulations, set of initiatives. Um, what is the, 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 why do we talk about 55? The aim is to reduce carbon emissions by at least 55% by the year 2030. And 2030, if you look at it, is almost just around the corner. So we don't, uh, there's not much time. So this, this is why it was so important to uh, um, attract the, uh, draw the attention to this, to this fact. Of course, all of this is not possible if you don't have any digitization, and you need continuity of the digitization in the value chain. Value chain. So you have to have, if you have data, cannot be, uh, um, let's say, in silos. It needs to communicate with each other. Quite important. What will help is that the digital tra the transition and the sustainable transition will overlap. So there will be a lot of measures from the European uh, Union that will help uh, further this. And this is, I think, also very important. Um, so the decision to have a GS1, or sorry, GS1, EU chapter forum at the Building Smart level, I think is very important because you need to have that direct link to the European institutions knowing what is coming up. Um, then we had a, quite a lot of, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of use cases from various angles. Uh, you see all the presenters here. And basically, the, the questions and the topics that were addressed, you will find them on the left-hand side. I'm not going into detail. I invite you to, uh, to listen to the recordings of that day. Um, they're all available, I think, on the, on, the, on, the, on the app. And then we went to a panel. So we had a, a panel uh, discussion for half an hour around sustainability, very uh, interactive, very uh, um, uh, with points of view from, from various people, from various uh, coming from various backgrounds. <clears throat> and at the end, we had uh, two breakout rooms, just to keep the activity going. Uh, as I mentioned, two, uh, two uh, breakout rooms, one specifically on the, um, the product data and which processes require product data. And I think the first um, conclusion that was drawn right at the start of that breakout room was, uh, we should rather go for which process do not need product data because if you see what everything is, is going on, it's an easier way of uh, going forward. Talking about the digital product passport, again, DPP has been quite often mentioned during the, the, the workshop. And on the other hand, we had how to embrace circularity. So circularity in the construction um, uh, business, the AEC sector, and what are the main triggers for success. We will analyze all of these uh, moving forward. Um, so we had... Uh, quite a good representation of uh, GS1 people in the room, a lot of manufacturers that came along, a lot of building smart people, also from the product room. So I think we had um, a broad um, community there. What is next? Good question. <laughs> we had, again, we had quite a large attendance. Um, the interest for the various use cases, awareness raised around the European regulation, I think was quite good. Um, and the discussions and exchanges on stage, off stage, after the workshop show that uh, there was, um, it, that we certainly need to do something now after this, organize something. What exactly, I think um, we need to debrief first with the colleagues, former colleagues from GS1, with uh, Building Smart as well, international, to see what is possible. Should we do a next uh, workshop in, um, in Valencia? There's a fair chance that it will happen. Uh, on the other hand, uh, should it be the same format? Maybe we should have more interactivity. Maybe it should only be half, uh, half a day or two half days. We will have a look at that. Um, anyway, what we need is more room for Q&A because there were quite a lot of questions um, that couldn't be all addressed. And maybe also some smaller breakout rooms because uh, creating those little communities uh, with each other, with exchanging views, not in the full room, but more in, in smaller circles has certainly been uh, very, very helpful for everyone. So I invite you to have a look at it. If you have some ideas, if you have attended, please share them with, with us because we need your, your input to, to move forward. And I hope that uh, we will see you in, uh, in Valencia for a workshop, anyway, for the Building Smart International Summit, of course, um, and uh, hopefully for a workshop and the discussions on product data. Thank you.
Thanks, Enzo. Um, we're really grateful to Enzo actually for coordinating this piece of work. As you can tell, it's, as you know, it's really, really important, and it, uh, it's something that we're all in, interested in. But it's it's an ability to give us really tangible outputs on this topic, uh, rather than just talking about it. And you can also tell it's a good example of how an initiative like that, um, central at Building Smart, is reaching out into the various domains and everybody's collaborating together. Um, you know, where else in the world, what other institution can you come to and have that sort of level of uh, um, deep working on a, on a topic like that? I'm going to invite the airport domain to the stage. That's going to be Ariska Droog and Gerard van der Heer. And they're going to tell us in 10 minutes all the great stuff that's happening in the complex world of airport cities. Does it work? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to give you guys a short update on the airport domain, not airport room anymore. Uh, we had three sessions uh, this week during the summit, um, so we'll be talking about that um, for the next 10 minutes. First topic is, of course, the Airport Entities Project. For most of you who've been attending the summit, this is basically the main project that the airport domain has been working on. Um, a lot of progress has been made by now, um, but moving slower than, we, <clears throat> than what we would like. Um, but it was a good session. We um, discussed the entities that we are identifying that are very airport specific. Um, and what we have done so far is um, link them to, or map them to IFC. Um, this picture was also shown in Rome, um, but where we are today is actually that we um, processed all of the baggage handling uh, results from the survey that has been out for the last two years. Um, and we uh, actually were able to add them to the uh, Building Smart Data Dictionary for now still in the test environment, um, but that was a big next step uh, for us. Learned a lot from um, doing that because we um, identified uh, some of the um, challenges that we are running into um, regarding, for example, identifying properties now. So we will also be looking at um, creating a property set for the airport domain. Um, and we still want to talk to some other specialists within the airport domain, or baggage handling um, domain, baggage handling specialists, <laughs> uh, get a little bit more input. But I think it was a, it was a good step. Um, worked hard to add that and we'll be using everything that we learned from the baggage handling um, and apply that to the other surveys that are live right now um, and so what i just said we added the baggage handling to the test environment of the bsdd um, hopefully it'll be live in the um accept or in the yeah, acceptance environment soon uh, the next step for 2024 is to look at the properties um, and of course add the other objects to the B bsdd and I'm guessing that we'll also be, have, uh, be look, taking a look at the properties that will be needed for some of those um, objects. At the same time, we also identified a lot of objects that um, um, require cross or domain, cross domain. We need the other domains for some of, uh, of the properties. From the baggage handling, a very simple one is a ladder, a very simple object, um, not airport specific, but very crucial for the baggage handling system. Um, so that's something that we would have to discuss with some of the other domains of how to handle those. Um, yeah, that's that's basically it. What we've been doing for for the airport uh, domain, we've been doing it also with um, Carl Fitzpatrick, who is in uh, Auckland. Um, so there's a 12-hour time difference. So we meet every Monday. Um, but it, yeah, it's been really really good to to work with with this group of people. Here's the link for the other surveys. So the surveys are still live until the end of this month. Um, we're still looking for input. Um, so if you are familiar with um, anything you see here, terminal, which is a building, um, but also the uh, civil airfields, uh, meteorological, anything, um, please fill out the survey and help us. We're really looking forward to, to the responses and going through all of the results from that. Uh, survey closes the 30th of September. Um, so spread the word. With that, <laughs> I had to post this from Maya and Christoph, who are not here to now because they left <laughs> quite early, but they were very excited that they got to talk to Arthur um, about the BSDD development. And I think it's also really gonna help the airport domain 
Um, and on a personal level, I think it's really going to help uh, Schiphol Airport as well uh, of what um, is happening over there in the development. Um, whenever this is live, I'm sure it will be posted on LinkedIn. Um, take a look at it. It was uh, uh, an interview being done during lunchtime uh, so because it was very last minute. Uh, but I think it will be worth um, taking a look at it once uh, they publish it. We also had a roadmap session for the first time. Um, it was a good session. Uh, Carl, as you can tell in the picture, called in from New Zealand. Um, we also had Mike, uh, who's usually at the summits, but he also called in. Um, Birgitta actually joined, who was no, uh, not really involved anymore um, with the airport domain, but she's still involved with the airport domain. We, just, we can't work without her. Um, we discussed a lot of, um, yeah, the, the way of, of where we want to move towards as the airport domain. So we didn't really like identify any technical projects, but really what is the purpose of the airport domain? How can we get more people involved? Um, what do we need um, to get more organizations uh, to join uh, Building Smart and particularly the airport domain? So we really took a step back, looked at airports uh, as an organization and some of their needs, then looking at the asset management needs, then looking at um, the, the airport domain needs, and then translating that into projects within the airport domain and outside of the airport domain. So we really are taking a step back um, and identifying um, these um, value propositions so that we can then use that as input for uh, a new version of the uh, roadmap of the airport domain. The conclusion of the roadmap session um, is pretty Pretty simple. Um, we need software, software vendors to be involved early on, uh, so we'll be um, getting in touch with them. Um, we need more buy-in from stakeholders in order to get the project or to get the airport domain moving a little bit faster. Um, at the same time, we need more airports to join. Um, we obviously had COVID, had a big impact on the aviation industry, but I feel like we're at the point where we really need to step up our game and get more airports um, involved, uh, but in building smart. Um, and not just airports, but also anyone working with or for airports. Uh, we need funding, as always. Um, so that's, that's something that we need to look into as well um, a little bit more. Um, a lot of the work that's being done is in our free time, which is amazing. But in order to get the projects to move faster, um, we need more funding. And last but not least, obviously, everyone here agrees probably, we need more time. <laughs> we need more time to get everything done um, and aligned. Um, to finish off, we had a very good session with the Building Smart International Board. Um, Gerard will tell you a little bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you. After uh, this uh, summit with a lot of openness, open standard, open BIMS, we also experienced an open attitude in, with all together, uh, but also with the board. If you can see, when you look at the roadmap, you look, how can we get from here to there? And we need something. You can see we need money, we need all kinds of people. But what we essentially need is to get the clients on board. That's what we need. So if we need, if we get those clients on board, we need to have a solid story. And uh, we got the opportunity to discuss this with the board, that uh, by having, a, we, if we want to have a solid story, uh, one component where uh, our Building Smart is leading is, is the information, the continuity of information. So what we asked for, and we were promised, that we, that we will produce all together a story. Why are we doing it? With this story, and you have in all these presentations before, you all will also hear a lot of uh, client things, uh, regulatory things. We need to have a story for them. And if we have that, we can sell our unique uh, uh, services uh, like IFC, BCF, and all the other acronyms. But that is what we asked for. And, uh, and that means that story that, that comprises of a technical part, and I think what we have seen up so far, that will do. I think we have enough knowledge in this room, but also in the whole business environment. But we also need a business story. Why should you do it? That it needs figures, or at least directions of figures. And we need a, a marketing story. 
just to tell it. And then we will grow, and then we can go to all the airports and regulatory bodies like IC, IATA, ICAO, and all these kind of things. And all other domains can go to there, because it's not only airports, it's for all of us. So that was what we uh, wanted to share with you, and, and hopefully uh, in Valencia, uh, we, the community, the board, and ourselves, and all of us, have a more clear view on that story. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ariska and Gerard. The, um, I mean, there's two things I want to just sum up and uh, acknowledge the airport domain for. One is that they've been leading the way on these use case standards projects. And it's uh, that, <clears throat> excuse me, what um, Ariska just shared with us is exactly what I was referring to in the opening part of the plenary. And it's exactly that model that we're going to be copying and pasting to uh, uh, projects in the other domains. Um, and secondly, um, it's this business of communication and being able to explain to the industry at large about the benefits of open digital ways of working. Um, and it's something that um, all areas of industry are, are struggling with. The people in the community are already the enlightened. These are the people that have already taken the leap of faith they already know that software agnostic solutions are the way forward for uh, longevity and interoperability, but we have failed to uh, explain that to the executives of organizations, to the fund holders, and that's something that we're concentrating on now. And we're putting open BIM education uh, on the agenda of every domain leaders conference um, that we've done in the last year and also into the future. Because if we can't explain it, nobody can. Well, if we can't explain it, nobody else will buy into it. Right. Um, now I'm now bringing, are we okay? I'm now bringing the electrical domain onto the stage. So that's, uh, I'm asking Burnt to come forwards and uh, explain to us what the electrical domain has been uh, doing. So, hello. Uh, my name is Bank Mana. I'm uh, representing here the electrical domain. Just wanted to say, uh, so we are um, a quite new uh, domain. Um, so we are consisting of uh, some some companies from the uh, electrical uh, business, uh, like uh, uh, Schneider Electric, uh, Siemens, ePlan, and myself. I'm f uh, with the um, German building smart chapter, so I'm uh, representing that chapter in in that st uh, steering committee. And we had quite some um, uh, progress, I have to say, in the last uh, few uh, months, uh, because um, it all started to to try to bring the electrical domain more in the in the BIM world, uh, also be, to be represented better in the in the IFC uh, environment. And yeah, I think that was. In our, um, at least in, in in our feeling in the beginning, a big challenge. But after we we um, exchanged with with other domains and also um, saw how uh, yeah excellent the, the structure already is to to be used. Um, so we had some um, some other approaches we we put in. Maybe you can go to the uh, next slide. So here you see what, what the domain is about. So we are concentrating on the electrotechnical uh, trade with, within buildings. So it starts with uh, medium uh, voltage over transformers, over uh, low voltage power distribution and to final distribution on, on the, the low power. And um, what we find out uh, very quickly that it's, Sometimes not not easy to um, to connect and exchange data with uh, also other trades, so MEP trades, so mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and that's why we made use of a of a, a concept that was originally um, invented um, in a in an activity in a labo laboratory sector between a, a joint um, working group between Billing Smart Germany and the uh, International Laboratory Association called Egnaton. And that's 
called tech box and that is an approach we also now use in the electrical uh, domain which uh, helps us to uh, exactly do uh, what uh, what a big challenge was because normally uh, elect the, the electricity topic comes very late in a project but the thing is if you have the ability to um, to look at a complete life cycle of a project from um, the very early beginnings, the planning, uh, up to operation and demolition. And if you see that the whole uh, chain of it, and then if you have the possibility to exchange very early with the other trades, and then you can go earlier also in the project, then there's a lot of alignments uh, that you can just skip because you already are, are working closer together. And that's what the, uh, tech box is about um, so the idea is to have have kind of um, yeah information containers which gives a, a hierarchy um, between the different um, um, objects for example a switch cabinet or a switchboard uh, you don't see uh, or you don't see but you can imagine it so a, a switch cabinet <laughs> which consists of, of different uh, columns. And, and the switch cabinet itself also has some, let's say, um, interface information to the other uh, objects and environment around it. And that's what the tech box is about, that we just have, imagine, a boundary box or something with information that you can use in an early process to exchange data, to do calculation, to do simulation, things like that, uh, without knowing exactly what's in there, the, the content, if you like, of, of a tech box. So you don't know that yet, and you don't need to, because the, the architect is maybe not really interested in, in the tiny little things. And uh, more, it's more about how the, and then we came to a, to even to a connected uh, trade, for example, the HVAC, to know how much um, heat has to be uh, put away, something like that. And also in between, inside the switch cabinet or other trades, you have um, yeah, building blocks, if you like, who exchange uh, or have um, um, are dependent on, on specifications between each other weight or something like that and that's what what the tech box is about and what we also found out that uh, or we found out i mean that's also in the other domains the same uh, challenge i think that um if you are if you are in a special role that's not interested in in high level geometry and then you get for example in in such a domain like this tiny little objects which are very big and then you are not happy if your software doesn't work anymore because it's uh, yeah there's too much data in it you don't need and so the idea was to also break down the the whole uh, life cycle with all its phases to the roles uh, and and have a really a spot on what the need is for a special uh, role in a special phase and that's then we're in the topic use cases like the, the other domains. And that's what we're doing at the moment. We're preparing a set of use cases along the, the, the chain, the, the life cycle, and enrich them with information needs, with geometric uh, needs, and also with documentation needs. And then the, the great thing is that the topic IDS, which came up now, uh, especially at this event, the information delivery specifications, is another tool to have kind of a recipe to put, put in, you know, uh, what we need for each use case. And then you, ca you have a recipe for, for uh, in future for, for every kind of, of, uh, of need along the, um, the process or the, the life cycle and everyone can have the information uh, the person needs and not more nor less and and this is a basis you can work on and that's what what we're doing at the moment so our first use case is 
I think, 90%. We were not able to uh, show it this time. Uh, we had uh, a session about the, the tech box where we had uh, some more attendees than uh, last time because this was our, our second session about it and, and we were really grateful for the uh, yeah, all the visitors. And we also had in the in our main uh, session a lot of interesting discussions. And what we we want to do in Valencia is to show you uh, the first use case for sure, and even have two or three use cases to show you in, in Valencia. And that's uh, that's something we are really looking forward to, so that you really see what what. Uh, the progress is in the electrical domain, and we really like to have some interactions between other uh, domains, uh, which are also have the same challenges, and uh, then we work together. So that's a quick overview from my point of view. Christian also wants to say yeah. something. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Christian Frey. I'm also um, domain leader of this electrical room, and I put you. I want to put your awareness on our work. Because without electrical power, no beamer is working. The light would not be here. No Tesla will run on the road. And no airport will bring his passengers on the plane. So it is important. And it's getting more and more complex. Because in the early days, we just had the big cable coming into. And we distributed it to the floor and from the floor to the socket. That was easy. Today, and also thinking about this uh, uh, Fit for 55, sustainability and all the stuff, we have solar power on the roof. We have our electrical charging cars in the garage. We have our data center somewhere in the building and much more. So the big cable is not coming only from the button to the, from the garage to the roof, but also the other way around. So you have also battery storage with your electrical cars and all this stuff. So it's getting more and more complex and it must be already in the design phase where you look at it. And I ask you, the airport people, for example, come and work with us, make this stuff working, get your electrical people to work with us because we also need your use case. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> you said it all. Nothing else I can add. Um, so well done for turning off the beamer for uh, demonstrating that you need electricity. Apologies for that, Bernd. Um, is it working now? Because I think the next one's a video. Still not working. OK. All right. And, and is it the video of Greg that we're playing now? You there, Dan? Is it Greg now? Yeah, OK. Hi, Alan. Oh, Sorry comes. I can't join you. It was such a wonderful time uh, here outside Oslo. Uh, the hospitality has been great. Um, can't say how much I appreciate uh, the the event and everybody's participation and made it a very wonderful um, conference. So just giving a quick summary of the technical domain of what we did during this week. Um, we really had two sessions and I'll talk about those in a second. And the main goal is to start the process of sort of really taking the work we've done over the last two years of gathering feedback at our other sessions, um, start to coalesce that into the ideas that we certainly understand and think are the right way to go, but we need to start to test those. So we this is really the first time we put the proposals in front of people at a high level and then started to do some work on tearing apart existing data. Uh, that's a slightly impolite saying way of saying, you know, uh, understand how to reverse engineer into the new system from the data we have. So the two sessions we had were uh, the IFC 5 overview and then the deconstructing IFC 4X. So this is meant to say previous versions of IFC that would include 2X3. I just didn't have it in this title, uh, 2.5. And that's really uh, the big picture here is how do we go from a file and then object model. So one of the big uh, challenges we've seen in talking to people is this idea of distributed nature of their data distributed across, across domains. And so really the, the big idea is to moving to a system where we can have um, 
components that describe pieces of objects that represent an entity as a whole. And these can be both uh, IFC data, but also we're collaborating with OGC through a working group to make sure that this could even work for GIS data when we want to put them next to each other and expand the building smart scope and standards and collaboration. So the next uh, uh, examples of this is just the idea that we can deconstruct data outside of individual tools, put it together in such a way that it's useful for parties that are outside of a contractual boundary. This isn't stipulating any sort of um, required boundary, just that it's an important design concept of the work. And then uh, giving in a little bit more detail of how we sort of use this system in the context of a little bit more um, exacting problem, which is a um, sort of a, a facade and a building structure coming from two applications, how you would actually start to put those together, how we'd use relationships like we do in IFC today. So how to take these concepts that are already present that are the most, probably the most rich concepts that we have in IFC besides properties and object definitions and how we'd apply that. And then in the second, second session, really we focused on taking what's in an IFC, if you will, file today, 5C4, 2X3, doesn't quite matter, and start to um, understand how we have to take that information, map it into this new system. What do we um, simplify? What do we clean? Uh, this is just the very beginning of the discussions. None of what the things you're seeing here are representative decisions, but um, understanding that we need to take these steps. That's it on um, on my end. I, like I said, it was a great conference. I think we're um, kicking off the development of IFC 5 in a wonderful, wonderful context. The feedback has been great. Certainly there's hard work ahead, but uh, from the conversations and the things that we need to address, I think we're on a clear path. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. So yeah, generic standard development as opposed to use case standard development as we explained earlier. Uh, inviting Nick Nisbet from the regulatory domain onto the stage now. There he is. You're the last domain, but not the last presenter. Okay. So, okay, the regulatory domain. Uh, I hope I can claim uh, last but not least. Um, I think the exciting thing over the last few summits is we've discovered that the regulatory domain has legs, it has bodies, it has brains coming and joining in. We've got an excellent uh, committee uh, and people coming forward to volunteer with work and effort and contributions and ideas. And it's full of surprises because uh, out there, people want the regulatory system to be automated. And so every time you have a summit, someone comes up to me and says, can I just show you that we've got it cracked in this city or we've got it cracked at this university? or we think we've got the whole of South America cracked or something. So uh, it all seems to be working, which is pretty exciting. Um, this is probably our key diagram. And as Tommy said last night, um, nothing happens unless the regulatory system says you can do it. It may be about uh, concept approval. It may be about technical approvals. It may be about construction approvals or the right to occupy and use a facility. But if the Building Smart Vision is to work, then the place where we prove that it works is when we bring our schemes and our ideas up against society and the regulatory environment. And so it's getting really exciting. Um, I was delighted that Several of the awards last night went to regulatory systems um, and a bit on sustainability too, but that's another subject. Um, and I think the other big lesson is that uh, we can wait for governments to legislate, 
they probably won't. We can watch government bodies as clients making demands on our industry. Um, but the thing that really government can do uh, and the industry can benefit from is a regulatory system that helps us rather than getting in the way, that accelerates our projects rather than slowing them down. We had three sessions, presentations from uh, locations where the regulatory system is being automated uh, and analyzed and automated. We had a presentation uh, on situations where it seems harder than it should be, um, maybe because of the involvement of private regulation bodies, uh, maybe because the community hasn't quite cottoned on to what's possible. And then we had two projects, uh, two, two sessions on our current projects. Um, the regulatory information requirements, uh, even as we try and uh, draw some conclusions, new uh, jurisdictions, new domains are coming forward and saying, we've got a list of things we think are important. And so we're doing our best to incorporate those and to finish. We've got this vision that the idea of a project is to finish. Um, and uh, so we're... Uh, Tommy is working particularly hard to uh, make sure we do that uh, and to use the PSDD and the IDS to get the opportunities for regulatory information uh, into the, the, the suite of building smart standards. And we had a, another very well attended session on uh, our guidance for regulators. I always make the mistake to say uh, regulators don't come to conferences. Uh, and then a host of hands go up saying, we're regulators, we're at the conference, but we want to get the message out to uh, the community saying that the open BIM message is the message for regulators. Uh, whether they want to take small steps um, or whether they want to take the big step uh, for automated code compliance, uh, we are putting together uh, a small handbook to say we exist, these ideas are available. They're essentially free to use. Um, and uh, to try and uh, uh, turn the activity we've got into a global, uh, a global movement for better, uh, better outcomes. And of course, uh, a lot of our focus has been on uh, the, the building domain, building area. Um, and I'm really hoping that uh, as these projects uh, reach their conclusions, we can turn our attention to the infrastructure side, where the regulatory system is less obvious. Um, uh, and I think if we can demonstrate that the Building Smart Solutions work in that domain as well, then we will have a compelling case that, that Building Smart Standards are relevant to society. And that's uh, a good message that we want to get out there. So thank you to the team. Thank you to the hosts in Norway. We had a great time and we are making uh, ever more progress. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Now regulations at the top of the pile, really, because everybody needs permission to build. So you've now heard from all nine of the existing domains. Uh, before I move on to the next part of the agenda, I just want to say, I want to acknowledge a little group of people who you all know. Um, and this little group of people, they don't exist to run summits. They actually have full-time jobs during the rest of the year. And this is Claire Whitaker, Sheila Karai Lum, Laura Tan, uh, John, um, uh, mine's gone blank, Evandro, Jeffrey. Is that six? Who have I missed? Sheila, who have I missed? Dan Little. Yeah, well, yes, of course, Dan's our event manager. And what these people do is they are the international program coordinators. So they work hard during the year to um, manage the program on behalf of the domains and, and support them. Uh, they also have other duties as well. So finance manager, contracts and commercial manager and, uh, and other things. So thank you very much to our staff team for their support and uh, work throughout the year.
Right, next on stage is Leon Van Berla, technical director, to talk to us about the challenge. Indeed. Um, so it was indeed uh, extremely interesting to see. Uh, do I only have two minutes left? <laughs> Thanks. Use the mic. This one doesn't work? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to see all the domains compete with each other. Who's the most important, right? All of the domains. Uh, uh, no one can do anything without that domain. I, uh, I'm actually quite happy to see that, uh, happy to say that uh, the actual technology is the least important as long as it works. Um, and that's what uh, this challenge was about, to show you that it works and to show you how it works. So this open BIM in action, I'm not sure if you remember that we said it always works on PowerPoint, uh, but also you can do this, so let's do this. Uh, we had this process uh, that has all of the icons on there as well. Um, so um, the, uh, we started with the Excel sheet, um, created a an, an, an computer interpretable version of that Excel sheet of the exchange requirements, then created actual data that has something in there, that has the objects in there of the requirements, and then checked if the data actually had the objects in there and communicated the results using uh, a BIM collaboration format and shared it using interface standards. Things like BSDD also came in, the validation service came in. It was a pretty wonderful process, and I'm just here to share the success and show you some pictures of how wonderful it was. So remember we did the plenary session where Dutch people shouted pancakes again. That, that made us end up with uh, these uh, three requirements. Um, also, the, uh, the, the Danish people during this conference, I only saw them on staircases. Um, apparently, uh, they, uh, they, those are the favorite objects. Um, so the three requirements were a model needs these Danish staircases. It needs to have an IFC beam uh, with a certain property. And uh, we found uh, a waffle maker uh, inside the BSDD that was uh, an ETIM code. And, uh, uh, and, and we decided we also want to see that. So that was the start of the challenge. Create a computer interpretable file, not an Excel file, but a computer interpretable file that has these requirements in there. So, so then this happened. Everywhere around, people at the bar were not panicking, but like a, a, a nervous excitement on uh, to do this as quickly as possible. So we had a co build actually within half an hour, uh, and eventually we ended up with a lot of different uh, IDS files. So on Tuesday morning, uh, there was a, a presentation. Everyone who created a file could present how they did it how they turned this Excel sheet into a computer-readable file. Um, and we had, for example, uh, extra kudos to Alexander Warp, who uh, actually made a balloons pop when he uh, created uh, an IDS file. Um, the nice thing about this presentation was that um, after Monday morning when we had the challenge, uh, uh, until Monday morning when we had the challenge, uh, Alexander has never created an IDS file before. He's never used a software tool to do it. And he said, well, it's a challenge. I'm up for it. I'm going to try it. He found an Excel sheet. He found an online tool, had dinner first, relaxed, and then did it in the morning before he did this presentation. This really shows the power of uh, having these standards ready and available in different tools. Um, also, kudos to Ruben, who said, I don't want to do all of this searching in BSDD and then copy pasting URIs and IDs. He opened his microphone and he told the computer, my model needs to have a waffle maker. His system searched the BSDD, came up with the correct ETIM code and generated an IDS within eight seconds. He, he was the one that got the spontaneous applause mid gray presentation. It's awesome to see that. I ex expected like maybe two or three presentations, but to see this on a, on a Tuesday morning was, was really awesome. We also had Many other presentations, um, some experimental software tools that are still implementing, some uh, software tools that are just readily available today. You can use it immediately. Um, and we also had really a lot of fun. So just some stats. Uh, we had over 20 IDS files submitted. So within 24 hours, 20 IDS files were created. Nine software tools were used doing that. And we had seven presenters in the room. 
So there were people participating in the challenge that were not even here, but they just wanted to participate. So they uploaded a file, couldn't present. We only had uh, in-person presentations. So we had uh, seven wonderful presentations of these uh, software tools. So then we said, okay, now we have a computer interpretable requirement that you need to have a beam and a, uh, a Danish stair and a waffle maker in your model. Now the challenge is to create a model. Um, so next step, create a model. So again, we saw people in the back of the summit, uh, at the bar, uh, outside, in their hotel rooms, scrambling to uh, to put uh, waffle makers in models. If you really look closely here, so this is a this is a, a lock, a water lock. Uh, it has a beam, it has a stair, and here Iron is, uh, if you look closely, trying to put a waffle maker on top of it. <laughs> so that was, yes, <laughs> is Iron still here actually? Um, wonderful. So um, uh, we had, I've never seen so many waffle makers in IFC before. <laughs> I didn't know they existed. It was Akka, Brickscott, um, uh, SketchUp, wonderful presentations again um, from people who really had the courage to, to present this. Also, uh, credit kudos to Marcin, who took on the challenge of the infrastructure. So he came up with a road over a bridge uh, with a crossing following an alignment on IFC 4.3. Uh, really nice. Um, this is also where the validation servers came in. So we had, uh, again, also this is an example from Ion, who was updating his model, checking it again in the validation service, is it, if it was still valid. Um, uh, so the validation service is, has also uh, uh, got his place there to show that the IEC files that were generated were actually according to the schema. So stats, 10 IFC files submitted from six different tools. We had uh, four presentations from Blender, BIM, Arca, Wixcott, and uh, Quadri. Uh, so uh, Quadri is the new Tremble product who did the infra model. Um, yeah, generating data, generating a, a BIM model, generating IFC is not that spectacular. The most spectacular part was obviously the, the, the next step. So now you have an IFC model, you have an IDS model. Let's see if the data in the IFC model can be automatically checked against that IDS file. So again, people at the bar uh, trying to get to make this work, checking if it works, because we said you have to use the IDS files produced on Tuesday. You have to use the IFC files produced on Wednesday morning. And the presentation was Wednesday afternoon. So. Uh, people again trying to test it, um, and these these people look very relaxed as if everything works. But this was after they saw me, so this was before I. Uh, <laughs> there was a, still a slight uh, enthusiastic scrambling to make it work, um, and then we had uh, the the actual um, yeah the cherry on the pie, the presentations where um, again uh, we had a lot of uh, different tools. Um, that we're doing this all in their unique, different way. I think that's really the power of Open BIM. There are so many tools that all have their uh, different uh, perspectives and their different uh, markets that they want to uh, that they want to serve. Uh, so Bexel, for example, had a really nice uh, uh, statistics on uh, the issues they found. Um, ODA said we can do basically every version, every IDS file. You can run it automatically. Um, extra kudos to Akka, who said, uh, we're actually doing this in a live CDE environment. There's more people online, um, and uh, they're in Italy. They're looking at the model now. You can see uh, how they view the model. And they're Italian. They don't like waffles and pancakes. They like pizza. So they requested to remove the waffle maker. And remotely, because they had the correct access, the waffle maker disappeared uh, from the model. Um, and uh, I guess by now they have a pizza oven in there. Wonderful demonstrations. Um, also, Pasi from Solibri, who demonstrated the OpenCDE Documents API. So all of a sudden, we didn't only see a presentation from Solibri to check IFC against IDS. They also immediately shared uh, the model with Aconex um, and, uh, and also uh, got the IFC file from Aconex. So Pasi started with Solibri. He said, open my model from the CDE. The IFC came in, they checked, and they sent back the, uh, the, uh, the BCF issues. This is all thanks to these uh, uh, underappreciated standards that we are developing under this OpenCDE umbrella, I would say. A lot of things coming up there. Um, so stats again. In total, we have 11 tools uh, that have implemented this check, uh, seven presentations uh, from Archive Impairment, uh, ODA, 
Bimbo Explanatory and Salibri and Bexel. Uh, but we have a lot more. Oh, actually, yeah. So uh, to our surprise, it was actually uh, 12 tools that are using this because all of a sudden Oracle also popped up in their presentation from uh, from Salibri. Who Oracle is very active in supporting these um, open CDE APIs. Um, just a couple of quotes. Um, like I said, Alexander, who's, um, um, who, uh, who, who just took on a challenge, uh, never did this before, uh, but managed to get it on within 24 hours and still had dinner. Really wonderful example of how powerful these standards can be. Um, a quote from someone who said, I'm surprised so many tools already support this and so many more to come because we had a lot of online participants as well that said, we can also do this. We're not at the summit, but we ha also have this functionality. Um, the B is the D connection wasn't in there yesterday. We had a couple of tools that just um, all of a sudden saw the power of uh, connecting the B is the D to authoring tools. They developed a beta version and that was demonstrated on the day. Um, so this works uh, to, to end users to show how powerful the standards are, but also we convinced some software vendors to now connect to the BSDD because they also realized how powerful that can be for end users. Um, and eventually we also saw the chat GPT che checker work in Japanese. So after the summit, someone said, can I try in Japanese, spoke a, a, a Japanese uh, query into it and it also popped up. Very, very surprising. So. Um, like I said, we all had a lot of fun as well. This was typically one of those events where I can't repeat the jokes. The only thing I can say is you had to be there. It's, this is really true. You had to be there. Um, and that's also how I, uh, how I want to end. We, we did the full open BIM workflow in three days, proved that it work, worked. We started with, you can do this. And we saw a lot of people who can actually do this. They didn't even realize they could do it, but they can actually do this. There's a lot of software tools out there. This is maturing more and more. Uh, you could really see all of these different standards and services coming together. Um, and, and by them coming together, you could also really see the power of them coming together instead of just the individual parts. So the only message that I have to, to wrap up is go for it. <laughs> actually do it. And instead of me challenging you and sending you home with uh, go do it and figure it out yourself, we actually have a, a BIM training camp uh, to help you with that. And that's where Celine uh, wants to say a few words about. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, you can do this, but uh, yeah, you're all uh, open BIM geeks, so that's not really a surprise to me. Um, what we want with PSI and with the compliance uh, portfolio in particular is that everyone knows how to do this. And that's why um, we invite organizations to join a cool project. Um, we will offer special training to our, um, employees in your organizations um, focused on this. So the latest open standards and solutions. And this training will prepare them to take part in uh, open BIM games, so very intense, let's say, hackathons or boot camp that we uh, organize in the next summit. And um, this project is not only about this. Um, those who will join, they will help to create a content, a body of knowledge that we can use, uh, reuse uh, to organize open BIM games in the future. And we can tweak this to fit uh, different places, different domains, different uh, special organizations, you name it. So um, that's one thing. Uh, the rest is that we plan to align what people learn in these Open BIM games with the content of professional certification. So even if your teams cannot participate in the games, they can still learn the same things um, through BSI registered training providers. So uh, this project is all about teamwork and creativity and combining play with serious know-how. Know um, and like with each project, uh, we will need funding. So this is a call for sponsors. Please reach out to me um, after this if you're interested. Um, I will share with you a, a detailed um, project proposal. We might have to readjust this in the budget 
um, the sponsorship packages to uh, depending on how many organizations will join. But I'm really uh, hoping that uh, soon we can announce the next version of the Open BIM Games in the coming summits. Blows my mind. What an inspired way to demonstrate the functionality. We've talked about moving the dial a few times uh, this morning, but that, uh, but for me, that's really moved it on um, and, and it helped explain um, you know, the functionality of the, the BSI standards and the op opportunities. And I think everything we've heard this morning uh, illustrates and demonstrates the variety um, of skills that we have in this community, um, you know, in all areas of the um, the, the built asset environment of the ecosystem. Wow. I'm going to invite Stern Sunnerson to the stage, who is leading the Norwegian chapter. I'm just looking around. Ah, there you are, Stern. I first met Stern in 2015 when he was the leader of the Norwegian chapter. <laughs> and here he is again. Okay, see the screen? Okay, and this is working. Hello, everyone. Um, as uh, Brage, is Brage here? You're there. I didn't see you. As Brage mentioned the first day, um, he will be stepping down uh, as CEO um, 1st October. And um, I will be stepping up in, in uh, the acting director until the, uh, the board of Building Smart Norway has uh, found the, the next uh, CEO. Um, I put my contacts there so if you need to reach out. So on behalf of um, members of Building Smart Norway uh, and the board, uh, we I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to Brake for his uh, dedication and work for both Building Smart Norway and the international community. So should we give Braga a hand? <laughs> it's been great four days, uh, both with old and new friends in the international community. It's been, I believe, it's uh, 450 approximately participants, 50 of them from Norway, um, I also want to thank, on behalf of Building Smart Norway, um, Building Smart International, for the opportunity to have the summit here in, uh, in Norway. It's uh, a great experience, especially to um, Dan and Aiden. Maybe I should mention more, uh, but especially Dan and Aiden, who has uh, for their smooth and professional collaboration with us. Um, and also, of course, many thanks to Building Smart Norway staff, Samina. Alessia and Torkel for their enormous effort to make this the best summit yet. Should we give them a hand as well? <laughs> I couldn't help myself to, to add this slide uh, because I think the last time we had something of a equivalent to a summit in Norway, I think that was actually back in 2012 where I was managing director um, and um, it was back then mainly meetings in technical rooms and, and the user room. And you also had two uh, entirely new rooms, a product room and, and process room um, at that time. Uh, afterwards, we also had a Norwegian um, Open BIM uh, conference, all in English actually, to include our international guests. I think we were about 250 participants. The lady you see on the screen, uh, a year later, she became a uh, prime minister. So don't say that building smart does not improve your career. Um, this one, I'm actually going to share some thoughts. I've been tasked by the board to uh, produce an action plan um, to, to which way we are going in the future in building smart Norway. And after some weeks uh, discussing with Brag, with the staff, with members, and with the board, I've um, come up with, I see some potentials uh, for further development. Um, these are my thoughts. It's not been, been dealt with or agreed in the board, 
Um, but I want to share them with you because if you have had um, similar thoughts or uh, initiatives, I would very much like to hear from you and hear, listen to your experiences. Um, so th the first one I want to share with you is that in, in Norway we have um, a very strong community. We have uh, um, quite many members, uh, small and large corporations, uh, a vari variety of different sectors. Um, we have very long relationship also with the international community, very good standing in our national ecosystem, other organizations uh, we are working together with. And Building Smart Norway is the only organization in Norway with such a network and the possibility to solve uh, general issues uh, on OpenBIM. Um, however, we do see some potential and for example, to get better representation of, from large contractors uh, municipality and clients and owner organizations. And we need to discuss how we can actually make building smart Norway attractive for, for, for them as well. Um, one of the ways I think we could do that is to uh, get more focused on core activities, which in my view is implementing Open BIM. Um, and I think we could produce more solution and services that will ease the implementation of uh, Open BIM standards. Many small and medium-sized enterprises struggle with implementing Open BIM and, and, and uh, create value. Uh, they're highly skilled professionals in their fields, but they lack the both technical and legal expertise uh, to, to make those changes in their business. So I see a development, uh, potential in developing um, solutions for, and services to making this transition uh, to Open BIM more smooth. I don't want to go into details, but you can see some of the ideas we have on the screen here. Um, is that? Or another thing is that um, implement, implementation and generating value with OpenBIM often require larger organization changes and investment. So I think it's important that we uh, include and address senior executives um, in our thoughts and make them know, actually give them knowledge of the opportunities in OpenBIM, but also the challenges. Um, addressing uh, senior executives also could have um, a bonus benefit um, that will, uh, they, they see more direct value of, of a membership in, uh, in building smart. We do talk a lot about sustainability and often Sustainability is uh, quite complex. It requires a lot of knowledge. And um, I think there is kind of a lack of direct um, means or activities that organization and single users can actually start doing now, uh, or, or at least. And, and actually it makes many people uh, wait and see where it leads. and. And this inactivity, we don't have time for that. Um, everybody needs to get on the train. Um, and I think that we can take an opportunity here and show some leadership. And actually using some of the existing technologies, low-hanging fruits, make it more available and give training to the industry um, and uh, lowering the threshold to, to, to work with OpenBIM in order to achieve a more sustainable uh, future. And, actually so just to start now. I think that is very important that we start raising the digital liter literacy of, of, the, um, of the industry. Another thing I am missing, uh, lastly, is actually to what extent do we know the effect of Open BIM, both on project level, on organizational level and societal level? Um, I think that the, the industry, the building industry, construction industry, is, is quite bad at measuring and benchmarking, or at least sharing those, uh, their findings. So I would, this is something I don't think we should do alone in Norway. I would actually endorse that all chapters uh, should work together and find, this is actually an example from, from Building Smart Denmark, um, to generate more knowledge about the effect. Um, and there will be two, 
uh, main benefits of that. One is simply for marketing purpose that we can actually say this works and, and it has an, a positive effect. So it's worth the investments. And secondly, it would also help us to focus uh, on the development and investment with, with highest returns. So these are some of the discussions we're going to have in uh, Building Smart Norway in the months to come and hopefully also the years to come. Um, so lastly, I would just once again thank Building Smart International uh, and Building Smart Norway for, for this uh, great summit. Thank you. Well, that was great. Thank you very much. And uh, we've come to the sort of wrap up and conclusion part. The double act is back with uh, Dan and Aidan. So uh, I think we'll just do a few wrap up slides. And once again, want to thank you all very much for participating at this summit. Um, this has been a, a wonderful event, I think we'll all agree, but we would like to ask for your feedback, uh, good and bad. Actually, sometimes it's the, the things that we don't want to hear that help us improve. So please do let us know if there's things that you think we could improve on for next one, and that always helps us to iterate and, and move on, so we'll be sending that shortly. I've got a few thank yous, obviously, to, to make to putting this together. Um, firstly, you know, I'd like to thank the Building Smart Norway team, Samina Torgil Braga, um, and the support from the board to, to help make this happen. Uh, we've certainly had lots of conversations over the last four years about this event, and I think it's really great that we were able to, to get this done, and they've been wonderful to work with and always very accommodating to, to all the, the requests that we have. Of course, I'd like to thank the Building Smart International team, in particular the moderators that have helped throughout this event. I think we're starting to get really good uh, with managing the platforms and the people. And so I know they're ingratiated in the community and I think that's also very helpful. So thank you to, to them. Of course, thank you to Dan as well for his uh, great leadership at these events and ability to problem solve. And I think, uh, yeah, I'd like to just give them all a round of applause. I realized there was someone I forgot, but I did mention last night Henry Little as well for all of the wonderful images that we get so efficiently. So thank you, Henry, as well for, for, for that being an extended part of the team. So we look forward to having him in Valencia as well. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. Again, they helped make this happen. And I know Sergio said earlier, but uh, we, we, we will open up sponsorship opportunities for Valencia as well. And thank you once again to our platinum sponsors, our gold sponsors, our supporting partners, our cocktail sponsors, and the coffee sponsor, as well as our event sponsors. So thank you all very much for your support. With that, I'd like to hand over to Dan, who's just going to give a, a few last bits of uh, uh, information to share. Yeah, we just had a, um, a feedback session with the hotel. So we've been giving them our feedback. And um, we actually just learned in that meeting this morning that all of the uh, delicious food that we've been experience over the, experiencing over this week, which I think and hope you all agree with, um, will not go to waste. So they have two initiatives. The first is they partner with a company called Too Good To Go. So every day, uh, this company Too Good To Go do come and collect food and deliver it um, to the people that need it. And the second thing is they have a, um, for anything that can't be collected that does have to be wasted, they have a machine that deals with the wastage and then it's fed to animals. So I know we had this initiative in our last uh, summit that we promoted a bit better. We've only just found out about this, but it's good to know and I thought I'd share that information, pass it along. All of, yeah. <laughs> the things that we get asked the most as the week starts to wrap up is, when can I watch the recordings, first of all? I'm pleased to say that we've been working in the background. So everyone that has a ticket, it doesn't matter what ticket type you've got, you have access to the Hopin platform. When you go into the Hopin platform, you can go on the uh, recording section and everything up to the end of yesterday, except for two, which I think are still processing. So maybe give it half an hour. They're all available online. And then this closing plenary will also be made available within the next sort of 24 hours. So already all the recordings are 95% ready for you guys to watch. They'll be available in the Hopin platform for about six weeks. Um, and in the meantime, we'll be making a few crops and edits to the recordings, putting them on YouTube, and then they'll be publicly made available. You'll be uh, made aware when that happens. And 
also subscribe to our YouTube because then you'll get notifications. That's the easiest way. Next thing is presentations. As I'm sure you can appreciate having spent the week here, we have a lot of presentations and a lot of presenters. Hopefully we've got all of them saved now, but we need to just um, collate them all, convert them into PDFs, upload them, get them ready for sharing. As soon as that is ready, we will share a folder with you that contains all of those presentations. And photos. Uh, yeah, Henry's, I can see him sitting there editing photos literally as I speak. And the, again, there'll be a folder that we'll share with you with all of the photos. I know many of you feature in them and you want to be able to see them and share them. So we'll send out an email or more. We, it may be one email with everything in one go, or we may do it in drips and drabs as it's ready. But all of that is coming, and we are working hard to get it as quickly as possible. And uh, we did want to give a shout out as well to the uh, interview team. Uh, who are they're from Katenda, but they're not here representing Katenda as such. They are here for Building Smart to document the event for Building Smart. So that's Marie and Nyok, and they, I can see them over there. I know, yeah. And, and supported by Eva. They've been the two behind the lenses, but supported well by Eva as well. They are also working behind the scenes to start the processing of the videos. I know many of you have been stopped and questioned over the week, and we'll start to publish those on, on YouTube and or LinkedIn as well. So they'll just start to, they'll just start to go out. So we obviously heard from Sergio. He's now uh, on his plane back to Valencia where we will all be in six months' time. It's also been mentioned that they have this festival, which uh, it kind of builds up to the weekend after the summit, but it's during the whole week, if not longer. It will be busy. We will open sponsorship and registration and have booking links for hotels ready as soon as we possibly can. It will be probably within the next month, certainly sooner than we normally do. Strongly advise you to just get on and book and we'll see you there. That's it. Thank you. Caffeine at the moment, so apologies. So hopefully I've got some, oh yeah, you can see the slides there. I will make this very short because uh, I think if you're like me, you've had an incredibly busy week, uh, a fantastic week. And, and actually, I should say, you know, I, I snuck into Montreal as my first experience of, of building Smart International last year. And that was obviously the first summit back after COVID. I was then there for Rome, which is just brilliant, you know, move the bar on again. And I really worried about this one because how do you beat Rome? Uh, but actually, the buzz, the interaction this week has been brilliant. So, you know, I, I am in awe of what has been achieved here by the Norwegian team, by the Building Smart International team, and by all of you. This has been a brilliant week, and, and thank you so much for that. So, generally, thank you. So, I've got the fun task of trying to draw a theme or, or a few lessons from the week, and you can imagine that this is utterly impossible. So, I'll, I'll give it a quick crack, but um, you'll have your own takeaways, and that's brilliant because that's part of the diversity of this organization. So, there was that memorable phrase at the start of the week, you know, ski jumping after Patrick. And I'm going to see how far I can sort of push this analogy. Uh, so, apologies. Um, it's, it's a nice sort of analogy really of actually where we are in this organization you know you're in midair it's a mixed blessing you can see a long way from up there you know you can see the future we've got people in this room who can see the future you know we've got so many ideas so many inputs um, as to where we could go the problem with that is the future is coming quite fast and it's fairly non-negotiable if you're up in the air looking down at that landing strip it's going to hit you in the face pretty soon so actually, the challenge that we've had this week and the challenge we've got in the next few months is how do you prepare for that landing? And I'm really sort of stretching it now. You know, a small little landing zone, quite difficult. You're probably not going to be doing this on a repeated basis. So if you think about us trying to expand actually our relevance, you know, expand that landing zone, get us ready for the future, that's what this is all about. So, so I've tried to sort of group the themes into how we are growing and preparing this organization for the future. So I think, first of all, about just the ecosystem. 
You know, I've had a lot of good feedback this week saying, ah, oh, we get it. We see how it all works together. I've even had people saying they can see inside Leon's mind and understand it. I'm not sure I believe that, but uh, rumor has it people are beginning to see how all of this comes together, and that's fantastic. So lots of work still to do to finish off some of these products. You know, validation service needs more work, et cetera, but then actually spreading the word and using this stuff. So we've got to build out that ecosystem. That's really important, but it's starting to, to bear fruit. We've got to then think about the next generation. You know, where does the future take us beyond that? So IFC 5, clearly, we've got to get that right. Some great work going on. But then actually the sustainability, there's digital twins. I can't even read what else I put down there. You've got the BIM GIS convergence. So as a community, we've got to think about our expansion into that future world and get us ready for that as well. So lots of important work going on. But it is going on, and that's, that's the great thing. You know, you're all working on this stuff. But then some takeaways for me, I suppose. Outreach, and, and actually we've just heard of this. You know, I, I could have used the Norwegian chapter slides here because it talks about the same types of things, but there is growth here into so many different areas. You've got the product manufacturers engagement this week, which has been fantastic, and, and I thank all of you who've made that happen. That's really important to connect us. Um, <clears throat> we've made progress with domains. You know, Maritime Domain is launching. Actually, water and power transmission. You know, huge excitement this week about doing more in these areas. We've talked about pharmaceuticals a little bit. So industry interest in actually stretching us into new areas, which is really important. We've got to be embracing that. Um, new members. Uh, we got collared last night at dinner by Certi to say we are now approved to join. That's fantastic. You know, we picked up a new member last night. That was quite pleasant. We've actually got a couple of other people talking to us about that at the moment. So expansion to membership, but actually what those communities bring to us is hugely important as well. And then the EU forum, important meeting yesterday, because just like the landing from the, the ski jump, the EU is going to hit us in the face sooner or later. Um, and I would rather the EU directives came with our influence, our contributions, you know, our expertise than without. So we've got to find a better way of collating our expertise and, and helping the EU on a path which is aligned to what we know is going to be really beneficial for the industry. So it's very, very important work for us there. And then probably getting into the, the biggest takeaways um, for me from this week. We've talked about this before, but how do we better show the value of our work? You know, we've all, you know, all of you, I say we, you in your organizations have so many examples of where this is working. You wouldn't be sitting here if you weren't a believer. You know it works. You've got examples of the benefits of open BIM, open data flows in your organizations. But we are not capturing those examples, and I, and I hold myself accountable for this. Or we are not explaining the benefits. You know, what's, what's the role of open BIM in sustainability and asset management in handover, et cetera? So we've got to crack this. So we will be having a think over the next few weeks about how we can do this. We will be trawling our chapters, trawling our members for those case studies of finding a better way to share them. Because I know you need those to fight the fights that you're having in your organizations. We've got to help you with that. And we need your input we will help you as well. So that has gone from near the top of my hit list to, to the very top. It's so important for the future for us. Um, we also need proof points, you know, the, the hard numbers, the data that goes with that as well. So those things go hand in hand, but they are absolutely vital for our future. So uh, take it. I've got the message. I've heard you. We will do something about this. And then there's the strategic projects, which are important for us as well, because that is how we generate the, the income, the funding, uh, the working kind, but the progress that allows us to actually fix you know, the validation service, develop IFC5, et cetera. So we need your help you know, with your expertise, with your funding, with your contributions to get that moving, because act actually that's the spine, the backbone of the organization for the future. So lots of material there, um, but probably you know, just to finish, it's your community. Um, you have moved this community on a huge amount just in the last few days through your engagement, everything you bring, everything you represent. So you know, it's not us. It's about you and all of you and how you've supported us and how you see that future vision. So you know, I can only just thank you from the bottom of my heart for supporting us, pushing us when needed, uh, and helping us on this journey. So I wish you all the very best for the next few months. I look forward to seeing you uh, next year, if not sooner. But uh, 
to everyone who's here, everyone who's contributed, thank you so much.